ploughing through the 19th century newspapers in search of stories that provide us with an insight into the social habits and norms of bygone times, particularly in relation to crimes and how the authorities dealt with the perpetrators, you do tend to come across some absolute gems. In this video, I am delighted to bring you a report that appeared in the Morning Herald on Tuesday, July the 27th, 1830. It is one of those stories that makes you wish that you could go back in time and watch it played out first-hand to observe the participants and see the expressions on the faces of those present in the court when the perpetrator of the heinous offence was brought to justice. Sadly, that experience is denied us, so we must instead settle on the following newspaper account of what happened. The scene of the dreadful crime was St. Bride's Church on Fleet Street, the spire of which is known as the Wedding Cake Spire, on account of the fact that William Rich, the baker responsible for the first tiered wedding cake, is reputed to have based his design on the spire of this church. It was also the church where Jack the Ripper's first victim, Mary Nichols, was married, and a memorial tablet on one of the walls now remembers her. Of course, her murder and those of the other victims of Jack the Ripper were a long time in the future when in 1830 Mr George Gunn shuffled into the Guildhall Court to face the charge against him. Let's sit in on the hearing as described in the pages of the Morning Herald. Yesterday, a decently dressed man who gave his name George Gunn was charged with disturbing the congregation at St. Bride's Church on Sunday morning last by snoring so loudly as to prevent all those who happened to be near him from hearing a single word that was uttered by the minister. One of the Beadles said that the defendant entered the church soon after the commencement of the service in a state of intoxication and placed himself on a seat that was only calculated to accommodate two persons, and was already occupied by that number. He, however, refused to move, and to avoid a disturbance he was left in peaceable possession of the seat. But he had not occupied it two minutes before he fell asleep, and began to snore in the loudest and least harmonious manner possible, so as to distract the attention of all around him from the service that was going on. He made several attempts to rouse him, but with very indifferent success, and he was at last obliged to station himself at his elbow and continue waking him from time to time in order, if possible, to prevent him from seriously annoying the congregation. In this agreeable manner he was occupied for some time, but at length the evil reached such a height that he was compelled to remove the defendant and take him to the watch-house. Sir John Perring said that he thought this was hardly a case within his jurisdiction. As the offence was committed in a church, the defendant ought perhaps to be handed over to the ecclesiastical court. Here Mr Michael Scales, the common councilman, who was waiting in the office, held up his hands in an imploring manner and said, Oh, pray don't, Sir John, I can assure you you had much better hang him at once. Sir John appeared to be induced by Mr Scales's entreaties not to transfer the defendant to a place where such frightful consequences were to be apprehended, and asked Mr Gunn what he had now to say in his defence. Mr Gunn said that neither the education he had received nor his habits subsequently had been such as to dispose him to be guilty of any impropriety in a church. He was very much fatigued, as he had walked to town from Sydenham that morning, but he denied that he could have been intoxicated, as all the liquor he had had on the way was one glass of ale, which he got at the Edinburgh Castle. The alderman considered that a night's imprisonment in the watch-house was a sufficient punishment for snoring, even in a church, and the defendant was discharged. As he was leaving the bar, Mr Scales advised him to be cautious how he went to church for the future. And so George Gunn left the court and returned to the obscurity from which he had emerged to so annoy the Sunday congregation at St. Bride's Church on Fleet Street. 